so one of the things that, you know, talking about your Sac City days and everything, and, and one of the things that wanted, I wanted to ask you, because um, I get this question literally almost daily on my social media, um, you know, how, how can a catcher stand out? How do I stand out? I'm going to go try out for this team. I have a workout with this team. I'm, I'm going to, um, you know, try and make this travel ball team. How can I stand out? So from a coach with your experience, uh, and, you know, when, when all the workouts, we talked about me coming to a workout uh, at your place and all the tryouts and players you've seen, and, and it's, it's, probably, it's probably changed over the years, but for you, what made you say that is a catcher that I want in my program? Um, and, and just think catching wise, obviously at, at certain levels, you got to be able to hit too. Um, but taking offense out of the equation, what made a catcher stand out for you? Like maybe back in your Sac City days and then now in your, in your professional ball days? Well, the first thing you're always going to evaluate is physical skills. Uh, you like, you know, you, when you, you hear, well, he's a good kid and he really works hard and he's got a high baseball IQ and all that. And, I, and all that stuff is important, but that's not the first thing I want to know. I want to know, can he play? Does he have the requisite physical skills? Now, they don't have to be uh, polished and uh, uh, and it's not going is to, is it projectable? Does this guy have athleticism? Uh, and then we start looking for some of the more specific stuff in terms of, of agility and first step quickness and hands and arm strength and those types of things, vision. And then, then we start digging a little bit deeper relative to, to makeup. But, you know, you, you don't win with a bunch of really good guys. Now, you win with a bunch of really good guys if they have ability. And so you, you've got to look at the physical side first. And before you sign off, then you then you got to he's got to pass muster on the the the, the uh, mental personality traits that you're looking for for your program. Gotcha. I always I always tell kids that that uh, you know because I'll have several that'll reach out to me and say, how can I throw the ball harder? How can I improve my arm strength? I feel like I'm a good blocker. I'm a good receiver. I'm comfortable back there, but I just can't get it down there. Um, would you agree that, that throwing is probably the attention getter? Uh, yes, uh, probably, uh, especially on the, the high school and college level where the stolen base is more of a, a, a factor. Uh, and, and certainly in the day it was catch and throw. You know, if a guy could catch and throw and the throw piece was important, now the throw piece is probably the third or maybe even the fourth most important characteristic behind uh, catch block and game management but but if you can't throw it all it, you know it makes it very difficult on everybody else because then so much attention has to be spent on being quick to the plate and varying the tempo and moves to first base and stuff like that so throwing is probably the the one thing that that uh, is kind of a, an entry level tool uh, it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be a cannon but it needs to you, you need to be you know, near average in terms of combination release accuracy and, and, and raw arm strength. Gotcha. And I actually, I, I uh, just did a camp, I think it's been two weekends ago now with Tony Walters. Um, and I was, oh. yeah, I was telling Tony that uh, I use him as an example a lot when I talk about throwing, because again, that's such a common question for me is arm strength, arm strength, arm strength. I want to throw the ball hundred miles an hour. And I try to explain to him, and I use Tony as an example, that uh, you don't have to have a bazooka for an arm to have success throwing. You know, if, if, uh, if you can get rid of the ball quickly and put it somewhere near the bag, you can have a lot of success. And I'm sure you're aware of this. Tony's, I think, the average velocity. And I, I know he's got more velo in his arm, but he's, he's not worried about throwing it as hard as he can. He's, he's just like he says, he's trying to get rid of it as quickly as possible with those infielders' hands. Um, but his average velocity is like 79 miles an hour, but he still averages a sub two on his pop times because he gets rid of it so quickly. Um, he's uh, uh, obviously an amazing athlete, but uh, um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess it wasn't really. He wanted, a he wanted to sit in his legs and air it out. You know, he'd be an 84, 85 mile an hour guy, but that probably wouldn't throw out more runners than what he's doing right now with his ability. He makes off a lot by transfer and release and, and being accurate and 
having a, a wide range of throwing slots, which are often dictated by the location of the pitch and the jump that the base runner gets and the, the kind of leg that he's dealing with on the mound. Yeah, absolutely. I think he's probably one of the best at, just like you said, just where, where the pitch took him, where's the batter, and what do I need to do to get the ball on the way? And, and sometimes he, he doesn't even really square his feet up. He'll just flip almost like it's a middle infielder turning two. Right. And he, uh, he's, I think his release is, is average in the mid sixes, maybe a little bit higher. I haven't looked recently on baseball savant, but he's one of the better release guys in baseball. And he's ac very accurate. He's got, he's got a good feel for, for his target. Yeah, definitely in that consistent release point and getting it, getting it somewhere near the bag. So again, I guess my whole point of bringing that up is, uh, you know, all my catchers that are watching, arm strength is definitely a difference maker. Um, you know, if you can throw the ball hard, that's obviously going to improve your success, but it's not essential. It's not, it's not the, you know, when you get into the throwing component, it's not the uh, tops of the list as far as, you know, success and throwing out runners. It's not an eliminator. If you take a guy, it probably is good, probably the right in the top three in terms of arm strength is uh, Francisco Mejia. That he just got drafted, he just got traded to the Cubs. And uh, he throws, a, if you're near where he's throwing, it's, it's incredible the amount of, of uh, raw arm strength he can show you. But with that being said, the average is he's a 197 thrower uh, because it's just too deliberate. And if he could find the sweet spot between uh, a little less velocity and a little quicker release, he might, he might have better throwing times. But he can – so just having great raw arm strength, because he can show you 93, 94, I'm sure, probably averages right around 90 or 91. But he and Alfaro and, and uh, uh, Maldonado, you know, they're upper-level raw arm strength throwers. But they're not necessarily – uh, the top pop time guys. No, I hear that. I was actually just talking to Brian Watley about that last weekend as well. We talked quite a bit, um, who I know you know Brian very well. Um, and he was bringing up the, the Mejia throw, and we were talking about how he, Yates, uh, on that one throw, came about five inches away from <laughs> maybe even death when Mejia threw that ball and Yates thought the ball was already by. He started to stand up and it went right past his ear. Yeah, I, I, Mejia is an interesting player because in, in a ball, he had a 50 game hitting streak and he's very athletic, but uh, he is he is untapped and under, underdeveloped right now. And, and I'm interested to see what happens down the line with him because he's he's got an interesting uh, physical profile. Yeah, for sure. He's <clears throat> excuse me. He's fun to watch. That's for sure. And he's definitely fun to watch throw. Um, <clears throat> Another question that I wanted to run by you, Jerry, was uh, – so I, I run a I, – I do a coach's program as well, a coach training program, which you might be familiar with. I basically took my book and put it into like a video format. So we break down all the different components and everything. One of the questions that I get all the time from coaches, well, okay, this is all great information, but when – when can we train our catchers? When should I train my catchers? Like trying to get this accomplished, this accomplished, this accomplished during practice, especially when we have guys, a lot of guys who need to throw their pens. Back in your Sac City days, and maybe even now, I mean, it's a little bit different at the pro level, but um, thinking back to your Sac City days and Cal Poly days, um, how much time did you dedicate to your catchers? Um, was it uh, early work? or extra work at the end kind of thing? Or were you able to incorporate it into actual practice time? Like um, for the coaches that are watching, when's a, you know, what's a, a good way to, to, to handle getting the catcher specific work in because they're often, you know, they're so often neglected. Well, I can say in pro ball what I did every year I managed, our catchers would come in an hour before everybody else, at least an hour before everybody else. And when I'm up in the Cape, we come in maybe an hour and a half and, or even two hours before everybody else. And we kind of debrief and look at the video from the game before and evaluate their technique. And then we'll uh, look at the pitch calling and evaluate pitch by pitch and then go out on the field and do our physical stuff so that they're available to uh, catch sides and, and not miss out on the one-on-one the -on -one time. And so, uh, and in a lot of situations we have a, a bullpen catcher, so uh, there some of that bullpen time they, they don't necessarily have to be there, but 
so we don't infringe upon their offensive on the offensive side because catchers get cheated out of swings all the time, unfortunately. And right. so I try and you know the one thing, <clears throat> any there's no time constraints in terms of NCAA rules or federation rules, and we can be out there as long as we want to be out there. And so I you know, I utilize try and utilize that time as best I can without without killing those guys too. Sure. Um, how about again, like, was that even like your Sac City and Cal Poly days? I know there's rules as far as time and individual time and a coach actually being there, but it was the same kind of setup back in those days as well. Like catchers, if you well, want, there, to were, there, were, there were no there were no rules at, at, at that, or very few rules, and you, know, you had a baseball class, and you could have TBA and extend time, and and uh, we always found at least an hour a day, not just for our catchers, but for our position players as well. It was kind of, we were very separated in terms of catchers and infielders and then outfielders and pitchers all working separately, uh, individual development time, at least an hour a day. And then we'd go into, then we'd go into a team mode and then, uh, then we'd uh, go into our offensive, the offensive side of things. Gotcha. How about nowadays with the uh, with the rules and regulations? Do you have any advice for some of these coaches that really struggle to find the time? Um, I, and I always, when I do get asked, I just tell them, I was always the first one to practice and the last one to leave. So if I if I knew I had to, you know, sometimes it's a surprise, but if I knew I had to catch pens that day and I was going to miss out on my hitting rounds, then I was in the cage, you know, either before and or after practice. Um, if I wanted to get some extra throws, um, it was usually after practice, unless we did that during practice. Like, you know, what is your, so again, I guess for me, I always recommend show up before or after, kind of like you said, or stay after. Is there any recommendations you do for like practice, practice design, practice planning um, for some of the coaches? I try to stay away from post work with the catchers because uh, A, when we practice, we practice. We don't go half speed or half step it. We go game speed or above and so at the end of the practice when usually we'll finish our practice with some static stretching to reduce muscle uh, soreness and uh, we'll do a post stretch usually and when we're done I want to get them get them out of there now they can work out on their own but what I try and do is is uh, spend enough time with them one-on-one -on -one when we have the time to train them to coach themselves and so that I don't necessarily have to be there for them to get the reps that are necessary and uh, and so I, I try and, you know, like I tell all these guys, I said, my job is to eliminate my job. I said, it sounds, you know, like it's uh, trite, but it isn't. I really, I want to eliminate myself from the, from the process, but teach them how to, how to, how to teach them uh, routines that are individualized, but what they can do in a, in, in a group setting in that catching culture group. I love it. Yeah. And that's, uh, <clears throat> I remember, and I, actually, now that I think about it, I don't know if it was something that I that I stole from you or if I stole from Larry Lee, um, but we had a, a list of drills um, that had Monday, you know, Monday through Friday across, and then this list of drills, and then Monday was one color, um, and the drills that we wanted to perform on that day were that same, you know, it was all color coordinated. It was a list of drills. So if we weren't able to be there as a coach, the catchers knew exactly what to do and they've been taught all those drills and exercises to handle during their, uh, during their workout time. So, um, yeah. I think I probably got that from Larry because he's really good. Uh, and, uh, but what the big thing for me was that they coach one another, that uh, uh, it, 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 even though they're competing against one another, they're also trying to develop one another because if you develop a guy, you know, I'm a big believer in internal comp competition. To, to produce uh, improved performance. And if, uh, if one guy improves and he moves ahead of you, then, then you got to leapfrog him and, and work harder and smarter. And, and I always tried to, uh, I, I spent time with equal amounts of time. It wasn't like, oh, we're going to spend a lot of time with our, our one and two catcher and our three and four guys. Well, you guys go down there and catch bullpens and abuse them. I didn't believe in that because sure. those support guys were really important to me. And I spent, as much, maybe even more time, because they needed more of my time, because they were the third or fourth or fifth down on the on the uh, the uh, chart. Uh, so I'm I needed to spend more time with them, but I also wanted them to work together to make the group better. 
and we were pretty successful doing that. And that comes with after the ass assessing a guy's physical ability, it, the kind of guy that is good in a team setting that is out there to make someone else better, but besides himself, even if the guy is competing with him, because the ultimate goal is to have the best team and win the most games. And so, you know, having the right guys in in that lineup on a particular day doesn't mean they're. It's not necessarily the the nine best, but the best nine that that give you the best chance to be productive sure. as a team. No, I love that. I love that. Um, let me ask you this. So I, when I'm, when I'm doing my camps, um, you know, we have little chalk talk sessions and then we break up and, and do our training. And then we have a chalk talk session. We talk about each specific skill. Um, I'm always curious in uh, how my, what I call my big three or big four, like the three or four most important things for each skill, how they align with coaches, with your experience. So in your opinion, if you were going to, you know, you're sitting down, you have a group of catchers in front of you, and you're going to tell them, all right, here's, we're about to do receiving. Here are the main points that all these drills and exercises we're about to do. They're going to revolve around getting you good at this, 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 and this. These, what, are, what would be your, um, and we'll start with receiving since that's, you know, um, tops in the list now as far as skill priority. Um, what are your, your key components or points or whatever you want to call them to receiving when you're working with with your catchers well the, the big thing you know from a goal standpoint our goal is to make sure that every pitch that's a strike is called a strike and that at least 50 percent of those strip balls or shadow pitches are called strikes which involves some type of manipulation and and even on balls in the zone there's just there's a small amount of manipulation because we don't want to just manipulate close pitches because every time you manipulate it then it's it's a red flag to the umpire hey this this may be a ball may be a strike sure. and then we talk about uh efficiency in movement relative to being quiet and we, we always start off with with setup whether it's a traditional two-point setup or uh a, a three-point setup a one knee type setup and then so we're always cognizant of of providing the, the maximum uh, vision uh, tunnel for the, for the umpire and catching everything within the strike zone or close to the strike zone with a minimal amount of movement. And uh, when I talk about movement, I'm talking about moving, uh, leaning towards a pitch or moving your head as you're catching the ball, moving your head towards your glove when you catch it. We just want, it's almost like, a, you know, Venus fly catcher. He's, snatching you know he, he, he's catching that ball just just as you know we try to say ex expand the strike zone uh with no body movement and with with glove only uh, we want to keep the body as still as possible on those pitches that are potential strikes and and those pitches that are potential strikes are becoming broader and broader in today's game the, the strike zone is getting bigger and bigger and, instead of smaller and smaller Absolutely. So you said two things that I want to touch on. I guess you kind of already answered this. So you said with minimal move, um, and actually I, I'll use uh, Caratini, who was just involved in the big trade recently, that the game where you Darvish almost threw the no-hitter and Caratini was catching, there was probably, oh, man, eight to ten different instances where he moved the ball. It was probably 10, 12 inches uh, of movement. Um, but the umpire was still giving him the strike. So uh, I guess to get to my point, get to my question, I get asked all the time, how much movement is too much movement? Do you prefer a lot of movement, a little bit of movement? Um, and I always say, is, honestly, is, is what is the umpire giving you? You know what I mean? It's, it's get, it, get it to the edge. And, and obviously pitch location is going to be a big factor. Um, how far out of the zone is it? There's a line to be drawn when we even would try and move it. But that, that pitch that's two to – you know, sometimes three baseballs out of the zone. If our timing's right, we're there early um, and we're moving it a good six, seven inches. Um, you know, what, what's your philosophy or thought on how far the ball should be moved? Well, it, it, it's very individualized. It depends on, upon the pitcher and his ability to hit the target or just miss the target and the umpire and what, how much tolerance he has. But I, my contention is that the umpires don't see that movement. I think what happens is, they're right in the middle of their saccade when they're when they're shifting from the ball coming straight to the ball coming, like when a hitter drops his head down at contact. I think the umpires move their eyes right at the end, and when they're saccading, 
they really don't see all that movement. Now we, we see, and I know I, I put uh, uh, all types of videos on, on, on the, uh, social media. And when, when people see that there's like 30% of them, they react, Oh, that's just a really bad umpire. You can't do that. That's obscene this or that. Hey, if it's a strike and it helps your team and helps your pitcher, you know, you'll find, and, and if you have a good rapport with the umpire, which every catcher should have, and they'll tell you, Hey, you're, you're moving the ball too much, man. I can't do that. But you know, the reality is they, they're, you're a partner with that, that umpire because their job is to get every strike that's called a strike, uh, every strike that's a strike called a strike because that's how they're being evaluated at the end of the day as well. And so, uh, you know, they, they will communicate with you, you know, and I'll always encourage our catchers, hey, did I let it sit too long? Should I let it sit a little bit longer? Set up okay, you seen it move it too much? Whatever it is, because your job is to make sure that you help your pitcher execute his pitches. And if you can get him three or four inches off the plate by uh, really leveraging that ball in, either flexing it back to your midline or, or moving it from extension with your shoulder or whatever you happen to do, be doing, and you're getting good results, then, then you do it. And if you're not, then you don't do it. I think it's, the game will speak to you very loudly. No, yeah, absolutely. That's actually one of the <clears throat> more challenging concepts to get uh, and it's funny because a lot of the kids at my camps, I'll get the kids, the catchers to buy in. Um, a lot of times it's the parents and coaches that I can't get to, to buy into that. The fact that, and that's why I call it mitt magic. You've probably seen me call it mitt magic on my social media. It's literally like a magic trick. Um, I've talked to umpires. I, I'm, I'm sure you have as well. And they say that, you know, uh, I, we can't see it happen. And when done correctly, it happens so fast, we can't see it. All we see is the finished product. They see the tail end of the move, um, you know, the tail end of that, that glove, you know, tilt, the mitt tilt back to horizontal. Um, all they see is that finished product. And it's, everyone sees the center, center field camera view, you know, in the little box that's on the screen. And they, they see that view. But, you know, I'm telling them when you get back where the umpire is, they can't see it. It's been so challenging to get people to buy into that. Well, that's why uh, when we're working on receiving, I'll always take the next guy in line with in our progression and make him umpire so that he can really understand that. And if you take some of those coaches and you, even if you put a screen back there and tell them you're the umpire and you, I just want them to be able to, because really what they see is where the glove ends, not where, not where it first makes contact with, with the pitch. They see the finished product. And, uh, and that's why, you know, they, and the way pe people are moving pitches now, but where I get where the problem is, is when they, when young kids, um, they, it's, it's more, you know, if a little is good, then a lot is better. So instead of moving the ball just into the strike zone, uh, they try and move it waist high over the middle of the plate. And so they move it more than they really need to move it. And, and, and sometimes th it has a negative uh, outcome. Absolutely. I always tell them if the umpire starts to get on you about moving the ball, hey, stop moving the ball. You're moving it too much. That means you're doing it wrong. Your timing's off or you're, and or you're moving it way too far. So, um, yeah, 100% understand that and get that. Yeah, that doesn't happen very often in professional games where they're talking to catchers of moving the ball too much. Uh, and, it, it, you know, it used to be in the day it was – you really were it was more like you were sticking a landing and you'd catch the ball and the glove would stay right there. And if you move your glove, well, it must be a ball. But now uh, a lot of those pitches were strikes and have proven to be strikes with StatCast and now with Hawkeye and, and the new technology. And, and it's going to the strike zone is going to get even bigger and bigger if they ever go to robotic umpires. Man, that brings up a whole lot. We could talk about that for the next hour, but I honestly don't even want to get into that. I'm, I'm hoping it doesn't happen. I'll just say, leave it at this. Do you think it's going to happen? Uh, I think it's going to happen. I, I think it's going to happen, but I think that uh, receiving will still be important. How you catch the ball is very important to your pitcher. And if you're sloppy back there, that's from a pitching standpoint, that's, that's a negative for me. And I, I don't think you'll just be able to, to stick a, a bat back there and say, hey, buddy, pick it up after it stops rolling. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, I, I still think that receiving is going to be important.
Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see how it all pans out for sure. Um, the other thing that I wanted to bring up on the receiving side of things that you had mentioned was uh, the one knee setup and, uh, and how popular that's become. And um, you know, you've been in the game a long time and I know, you know, that the one knee setup has been around since the 50s, 60s, 70s. like there's been catchers. I remember seeing Elston Howard doing it. And um, a lot of those, uh, you know, uh, older catchers, different era catchers. I think back then they probably did it more for comfort and energy conservation than anything. And then as video analysis and analytics and everything start kicking in, they start realizing there's more, you know, more benefits to it and, and changing eye levels, getting down with that low pitch, getting lower to the ground, getting ground, all that stuff. Um, and that's not actually my question. My question is, um, and I guess I don't know if it'd be, might be challenging for you to answer since you're working mainly with, you know, college guys and above, but what are your thoughts on youth catchers setting up on one knee? Um, obviously I work with 90% kids nowadays traveling around the country doing my camps. Um, and in the last, I don't know, I guess it's probably been two years. I'm, I've been introducing the, the young guys to it. Um, you know, I explained to them that it's, this isn't for everybody. Some of you are going to get on one knee and you're going to feel locked in place and it's going to be, you know, uh, an issue, you know, getting out of your stance. Obviously, athleticism comes into play, but uh, there are a ton of benefits to the one knee, um, regardless of level. So, again, I'm kind of babbling, but what, what are your thoughts on high school and below using the one knee setup that's becoming so popular? Well, one of the things you said, comfort and energy conservation. I think that um, young guys really have a tough time getting in a good, A, a balance stance, one that they can hold their balance. They always fall out of their stance uh, and they don't have the endurance that, and strength that older guys do. It takes a lot less strength to catch from a, uh, a one knee stance. And I think that early with the, with the young guys that you expose them, to all stances, traditional two knee stance, left knee down, right knee down, modified kick stand, kick stand, uh, transition from a, 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 a traditional stance into a into a, a, a three point stance when the runner's not going. But I think one of the things I think you know, catching is catching the ball. Number one, I think it's a lot easier to catch the ball, and, and that's why we're. I think one of the reasons we're seeing so many professional guys now going to a one knee stance because there's there's no adaptation. It's it's easier to catch out of a one knee stance because for all the reasons you said. Plus, they're in a more vertical than horizontal back. It's not like you're having to to uh, get extension out of your cervical spine to get your head up so you're not looking through your eyelids and less impactful on your body because you're more anchored to the ground you always have better better uh balance when you're when you're down on a three-point stance because you have three points of contact and your center of mass is more centered you're not uh you're not falling forward with your weight rocking forward onto your the balls of your feet i just think there are you know from a teaching standpoint i would do everything but but i think that learning how to catch the ball properly from a knee down stance is a lot easier than learning with young players than how to catch the ball properly from a from a, a, a traditional stance. But I'm going to find out because everybody's a little bit different. You look at a guy like uh, Kyle Agashioka, and he is really low. He's got, for me, the lowest <clears throat> traditional stance. Uh, Austin Nola, even though he catches a lot off of a single knee, yeah, he's got a very low profile, and so does Austin Hedges. And but they all mix in the one knee stance. You know, it's an energy saver, and also it's a it's a strike getter too. Hundred percent. Yeah, it's one of the uh, most debatable topics. You might have seen my post uh, just a few days ago um, of catchers throwing out of a one knee setup. Um, because that's one of the things that I always get. You know, I'll, I'll talk about one knee setup in a post, and then I'll have. 17 comments that say well yeah but you can't throw from a one knee setup and so then i posted the video of all the catchers throwing from the one knee setup and then i go oh well you can't block from a one knee setup or the other one is yeah these are elite athletes world-class athletes you would never teach this to kids and i'm like actually 
I do it every weekend and I see a lot of young kids having a lot of success and really enjoying and liking getting on one knee. Um, and uh, so it's just good to get another, you know, uh, perspective from you and someone with your experience that, you know, it can work for the, for the young guys as well. Yeah. Well, the naysayers aren't, uh, they're not open-minded most of them and they haven't had enough experience, haven't done it and haven't coached it and haven't had enough experiences doing it. And they're not willing to at least, you know, I, you know, the, the smart man learns more from the ignorant man than the ignorant man learns from the smart man because he's, he's open to trying things. And, and I'm always looking for uh, things that will change my paradigms. You know, Hey, I'm trying to prove myself wrong and find, and, and the more options you have, uh, the more you can accommodate to the individual differences of your players. And you'll never know, uh, you know, maybe early on, uh, some players will be resistant, but early on, it, it takes time to develop that skill. And sometimes they find that the, the bar, they can raise the bar by doing something a little bit different. And, uh, and so I w there are no always or nevers in this game and you have to be open-minded and, and the more information, the man with the most information wins. And the more information you have in your file cabinet, the more you can accommodate the individual differences of the, the multitude of diverse players that you're going to deal with on a, on a, a yearly basis or however long you're working with them. Sure. No, I love that. Um, you know, not, I don't want to get too far into this deep into the subject because we probably could for a while, but I do want to say this, you know, we've been talking about social media and, and everything. And uh, I'm guessing if anyone, most uh, people that are watching us talk right now are following you. If they're not, they need to be, they should be. You're one of the best follows baseball guys to follow on, on, uh, on Twitter, of course. But uh, what I'm getting at or what I wanted to say is I need to, I need to um, follow your lead, so to speak. One of the things I run into all the time, in particular on Twitter is I'll post something and then I'll get a hater. I'll get a naysayer. And then I get into this dang Twitter debate with them trying to explain my point and they're so hard headed. They just will not give in and, and hear a different every once in a while I'll get someone say, Oh, good point. You know, I'm going to do some more research on it. But most of the time it just ends up being a battle. And honestly, I, I, I get so sick of it. I end up blocking people. I'm like, I don't even want to deal with your negativity and your lack of willingness to expand and everything. But I'll, I'll watch you post something and then I'll look in comments and you'll have some naysayers as well. Oh, this is whatever, whatever. And then you just leave them alone. You just let them say their silly comments and leave them alone. I need to stop clashing with these people. <laughs> I'm laughing because I know exactly what you're talking about. It would really irritate me. You know, it ruined my day that someone would put something out there that was so stupid. And, I, and I've responded not in a negative way, but, you know, just very nicely and then all of a sudden they fire back something else and oh this is ridiculous i'm gonna spend my time you know hey this is just opinions this is not a sermon from the mount it's not etched in stone it's just my opinion and it doesn't make me right or wrong or a good guy or a bad guy and but there's a a, a very small percent and, and i i will pick my spots where i will, will respond to certain people that they have yeah you know, i know it's not going to be a confrontation but as soon as it, as soon as it starts going in that direction, I'm out. And, uh, you know, because that's what, I mean, there's an element that that's their day. They get on they get on social media and find someone they can debate with, and, and that makes their day. And, and I'm, you know, I'm not opposed to confrontation, but not, certainly not on, on, uh, on the internet. And, and, you know, it's like the old saying is never argue with a guy who buys ink by the gallon. And so... <laughs> You know, if you're, someone writes something in the newspaper and you don't agree with it, yeah, it's better just to move on. And, uh, you know, it's not like I don't know the answer or uh, uh, I don't care. Uh, I just don't care to get in a debate on, on social media. And I have my opinion and you have yours. And that doesn't mean I'm right and you're wrong or you're wrong and I'm right. Uh, uh, it's just... Yeah. It, it's just, uh, it's not worth it. It just ruins. I'm just trying to get stuff out there and, and, you know, heighten people's awareness. And if they like it, great. And they can use it. It's kind of like a buffet table. I, anytime I talk, that's one of the first things I put up a buffet table. I said, Hey, you know, we don't need everything. Most of us don't need everything off the buffet table. 
and that's what this is. This is just a, you know, a, a cornucopia of data and, and, uh, and, you know, if it works for you, great. If you want to try it, great. If you don't, I, I have no problem with that. Sure. No, like I say, I gotta, I, I always try and, uh, Educate. I mean, that social media changed everything for me. I was just a local guy out of Northern Nevada. I did all my stuff here in town and, and uh, you know, I, I was doing all around camps and we had about 12 different towns and cities around Northern Nevada, Northern California. I go to the second I went on to social media. Um, what a cool tool we have to get to the masses. You know what I mean? To, it's, it's been amazing and it's been fun. Uh, it's been fun growing for sure. Yeah. It's, it's very gratifying too. I, I, when you, when you get, because you like you and you you're amazing at it and you and you're really you know what I'm talking about it's very gratifying to have people send you they'll send you just a little dm hey thanks so much that really helped or or uh you know whatever it is and and cuz early on when I, I i have only been doing this since i think uh 2009 uh when i uh or maybe i'm not sure the date that i started but i was just uh, i i didn't know anything about social media i didn't uh, and Alan Jager, uh, I'd written my catching, the first catching book. And he said, hey, we're, and we've been friends for a long time. And he says, he says, uh, your catching book is really good. He says, what, do you have a website? I said, no. He says, uh, well, do you tweet? I said, I don't know what you're talking about. And so he says, oh, you're a dinosaur. He says, let me help you out. And he helped me get started. And I figured some stuff out. And I was just putting little snippets from the book on the, on uh, Twitter and, and on Facebook occasionally. And uh, then I started to get people that were asking me questions about other things baseball related. And I started answering and I got positive responses and I enjoyed doing it. And so now that's part of my routine every day. I, I make it a point every morning or the night before I'll put something together. And then in the morning I, I post it. And maybe sometimes I'll see something during the day that I would retweet or have a comment on or something like that. But uh, uh, so it's been, I mean, for me, very gratifying because I, you know, it's kind of like, you know, as a early on when you're coaching, you're, you're take you're making withdrawals, you're taking, 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 taking. Sure. And now finally I'm trying to put some deposits in the, into the game and, and try and help if I can. And if, if that happens for people and individuals, that's great because that's what I'm trying to do. No, absolutely. Um, and you're actually, again, one of the best followers out there. I love, uh, I love watching your videos and, and reading. Sometimes it gets a little hard to decipher your, your <laughs> yeah. when you try and get so much information. I'm in the same boat. Like I'll post on Instagram first, Facebook, and then it takes me a minute to get everything I want to into Twitter. Um, and, and I don't like doing the, the little plus thing to add another. No, more no, I'm not a big, I try, I try and stay away from that. So I'll yeah. write what I want to write. And then I, look back and I edit it to try and get down to the 280. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. What's, uh, let me ask you this, since we're on topic of social media, so, um, and I know you experience this too, and, and, and for most of us, we just scroll right past, but, and I've actually had parents ask me this, so how can they decipher, and I, and I, I tell them, just do your research on who's producing the information, but how can they decipher, there'll, there'll be someone that'll post someone with your experience and it's just gold and then they'll scroll through their feed and someone else and, and someone else's, you know, tweet or post or whatever platform they're on will pop up. And sometimes I watch and I'm like, Oh my gosh, you, why'd you post that? That's going to mess with so many kids. And I want to say something, but it's not my place to say anything. So I guess my question is how can we help some of these parents and kids uh, weed out the, the, the crap and, and under, you know what I mean? Like what are some common faults you see on social media? Some of these coaches who are doing their best, but they're posting some drills that are just like, Oh my gosh, that's going to hurt kids more than help them. Like how can we help them decipher the, the good from the bad, so to speak? Well, I think with a, by having experience and gaining information on, on, uh, on their own being, you know, as a parent, you know, that, you know, you don't eat the, the ant poison and stuff like that. And, and uh, so now, a gaining a, a knowledge base on the activity, uh, finding someone that you know and trust that has a resume, and then using that person as a resource as well. And uh, you know, even if hey, what do you think of this? And 
you know, just give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down or, you know, having resources to, to, uh, to figure out what's good and what's bad. And, and, and it gets, uh, and it's not an exact science and it gets muddy sometimes and some things that on the surface don't look very good for certain kids have application. And so uh, the more you know about the activity, whether it's hitting, pitching, catching, or whatever it happens to be, the better you are equipped to evaluate whether it's good information or bad, or if you have a, a an advisory board, so to speak, where you have resources where they can go to Todd Colburn and say, Todd, what do you got on this? This is a little off the off the wall, and and you know, and then have people like you that they can resource to evaluate some of those things. Sure. So we're on the same page as far as that goes. That's what I've told them is just kind of do your research on, on what page are you on? What's the experience of the person posting? And, and uh, yeah, cause again, there's some, some stuff that I'm just like, ah, oh, I wish I could, I, I never want to chime in and just and put someone down or say, you know, I see what you're trying to accomplish there, but that's going to mess kids up because of this and that. And, and uh, so just, they got to do their research for sure. Well, I like to know Pete when it's so different than what, how I think I want to know what their thinking is. Uh, in, in that area, number one. And also, it's amazing how much good information there is in guys like you. I mean, look at look at our game. Look at how many internet guys have gone from the internet to big league dugouts. Yeah. You know, but there's a, it's amazing how many, every day I'm running across a, a different guy that that uh, really has some good things to say and uh, and stimulates my thinking all the time. I, I, I browse that internet all the time and look for stuff when I, when I have time. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I actually, I've done that. I've taken that approach before too. I'll go, I'll DM them or private message and ask, I saw your post, I saw this drill, I saw this exercise, you know, here's my concerns. What are your thoughts and why do you teach it that way? So that's another great point as well is just to get right. more details on it. Yeah. I look to the outliers and I want to know, you know, why you're thinking that way and, and what's your basis. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Well, we're almost at an hour already, Jerry. The time is flying by. Um, and I, when I put it out that I was going to be talking shop with you, I had uh, a bunch of questions from my followers. A um, whole bunch of people wanted me to um, ask you some questions. So I picked out some of my favorites. Um, there's one. This is another debated topic. Um, and I'd love to get your uh, thoughts and philosophy on this. Um, mask on or mask off? We're talking about tag plays. We're talking about, uh, yeah, well, tag, 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 plays, tag plays in particular. Um, and actually, the, there's a, uh, he actually played at Cal Poly as well, uh, a, a guy named Brad Ledwith. Pitts, he was actually, uh, just the season before I showed up, he actually ended up just focusing on school. But he pitched for Cal Poly, pitched in the World Series, the D2 World Series years. But uh, we go back and forth on, he's, he's uh, team mask off and I am team mask on. So in particular, tag plays, um, and then also just on every other play. Like I was always, well, I don't want to, I don't want to sway your well, thought. I, 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 you know, I don't see if you can catch a hundred mile an hour fastball with your mask on, you should be able to catch a throw from the outfield or a relay throw from the infield. And uh, there's too many advantages of mask on in, in case the throw takes you into the line and you're going to catch an elbow high elbow or something like that or a knee or the ball takes one of those in between gigam hops and hits you in the face instead of where you can stop and maybe recover and, and have a play. You know, big, favor, big, big fan of mask on. As far as pop-ups are concerned, uh, I know a lot of guys with, uh, with the hockey style mask, which I happen to favor, and I have no problem catching pop-ups with their mask on. I think you practice doing both, especially low pop-ups where you Maybe you have to make a figure four slide. And, and then the only time, you know, I, I really, if I'm going to get my mask off, if, if, if it's a rundown situation, you know, I feel if I can get my mask off once we start the rundown, that that that, that would be uh, advantageous. Uh, certain bunt plays, uh, depending upon uh, the running speed of the runner and where the ball's uh, bunted, you know, I, and I, I let guys, you know, I find out what they're comfortable with. And a lot of it is, is how well their mask fits. Sure. You know, if, if it if it's loose and it's spinning all the time and rattling around and it in, and it it uh, it gets in their way, well, you, you better get that sucker off. And if it doesn't, maybe you can. You know, I just find out. Hey, let's 
let's try it and find out what's faster, what's more efficient, where are you better? Uh, I think the, the rule of thumb is if it's a bunted ball, if it's a pop-up, you get the mask, uh, certainly with the bunted ball mask off in a hurry, and the pop-up, once you identify where the ball is, uh, the mask is off and mask is going in the opposite direction. I think that that, that always works, and if you can catch low pop-ups with your mask on, like bunted balls and stuff like that. I think that's fine. I just, I don't, again, no always or nevers. I just find out what works for that individual and I don't have hard and fast rules. You know, once you start getting into the, you got to do it this way and you got to do it that way and you can't do it this way, you can't do it that way, then you're coaching caution into your players. And what we're trying to do is coach caution out of our players and treat them as individuals as well. Absolutely. I always say it's, uh, it's definitely the, um, it's, it's optional. It's up to each catcher what they're most comfortable with. Um, but again, the debate that I always have with Brad, and he actually told me to pose the question in a specific way. He said, all right, it's the bottom of the ninth. Uh, your team's up by one. Bottom of the ninth in the World Series. Your team's up by one. You know, base it to the outfield. That, that tying run's coming in to score. Do you want that mask off so they have clear vision or mask on? And uh, I've always debated with them, told them mask on, mask on, and plays in the plate. Um, you can't help your team much from the, from the hospital bed when you have a busted face. Um, sometimes they'll come back with, uh, well, infielders don't wear masks. And I say, well, some of them probably would like to, the way the balls are hit at them and thrown at them sometimes. But uh, uh, well, well, we're, not, we're not infielders, we're catchers. And, 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 uh, and, and what you said there, that there would be a lot of infielders that would uh, be more readily uh, willing to front up on balls that are thrown in the dirt if they had a mask on instead of side saddling that ball and letting it go into center field. Yeah, for sure. It's uh, I think if you have a safe safer option, why not use it, right? Um, right. Yeah, and, and, and I've had enough reps with my mask on that I'm I don't think I'm any better with my mask off than with my mask on. And if I'm appreciably better, then maybe I should take my mask off and 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 way you know especially on that play where if i don't make it the game's over yeah yeah yep um all right so uh i know brad's gonna watch this so um sorry brad yeah hopefully our debate is is uh is kaput now um how about this so another one was uh thoughts on catchers calling their own game versus getting the signs from from the dugout um i know it's gonna it's, it's different for every level. I mean, you go down into youth ball, then you get into high school, then you get into college and professional. What are your thoughts on each level as far as coach calling the game and the catchers calling the game? Well, I can tell you one thing. If the pitcher and catcher know how to call their game, you'll win more games because they're closer to the action. They have a better idea what is the best pitch for that situation. And again, there's not only one pitch, it's an option line. However, uh, I'm okay with the coaches calling the game as long as the next day when they do their their post-action debrief that they sit down with that pitcher and that catcher and they go over every pitch. Why did I call this pitch? Why did I call this pitch? What's the thinking behind it? And it all starts with having a pitching plan, A, for your pitching staff and specifically for that pitcher, for that situation, for that game. And, and really we're talking about a, a one pitch at a time thing. It's not a uh, uh, a laundry list of uh, pitches that we're going to throw uh, because what I decide to throw on the next pitch is based on how the pitcher threw that pitch, how the hitter reacted to it, and where I think his attention zone is going on the next one. So I, I'm okay with that, but I also I want to make sure that I give the the some latitude, especially to the pitcher, that he is able to change the pitch and or location without any retribution regardless of the outcome of the pitch because I've always felt that the that the so-called wrong pitch thrown with confidence is better than the right pitch thrown with doubt so I want him to be confident and trusting in the pitch he throws and by the same token I want to give the the catcher a latitude to change the pitch when he feels strongly about pitch and or location uh, based on the last pitch that's thrown or the, how the pitcher's throwing during the game and you know, we don't they're so pitching is so nuanced that just a little bit of sink or a little bit of cut or or the, the command that we that that we know that the pitcher has that maybe the coach doesn't know and the umpire and there's so many factors that 
that come into play that if I can spend the time to uh, train my pitchers and catchers to call their own game, I think that it will help you be more productive as a, as a team. And we're, right now we're trying to develop a pitch calling app and we're working on that right now with a bunch of people. So awesome. some, someday we'll have something. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. One of the biggest arguments against coaches calling it is the, the tempo of the game um, and the speed of the game that a lot of people feel like it slows the game down too much and everyone's waiting for it from the coach. And then the, you know, some of the organizations uh, and, and programs are using the wristbands type deal. Um, and I, I'm there with you. I think if we can teach the catcher and pitcher to work together, uh, I think having them call their own game is ideal. Every once in a while, though, we're going to need to chime in as coach and, and make things happen. Yeah, I don't – and speaking to that point of the tempo of the game, if you're a good pitch caller, if you know what you're doing, the tempo of the game can probably go a little bit faster even. Uh, where, you know, I always say you think long, you think wrong. And so as a pitch caller, you really have to be able to go right now and, and – you know, instead of thinking about what I'm going to throw here and looking at your charts and stuff like that, you know, I'm not a big fan of that. I'm, I'm okay with, with the wristband. I've used them a lot. And, and, but that guy who is the trigger man better know what he's doing and, and be able to keep the tempo of the game going. And the signal giving, the thing that slows the signal giving process down is that catchers wait until the, the hitters get in the batter's box, right? To me, that signal's got to be down while he's looking for a signal. And as soon as he steps back in, we're ready to rock and roll. We're not waiting to start the process then. And I think he saved probably five to 10 seconds on every pitch if you do that. And that used to kill me uh, in, in the big leagues that we'd wait until the third base coach gave his signals like we're going to pick his signals and uh, before we decide what we're going to do here. And Because uh-huh. I can always, if, I, if something shows up, I can always – call time out as a catcher and get a redo if, 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 if something happens. Sure, 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 sure. Um, no, great points there. Um, another question from my followers. Uh, actually, I was supposed to say hello. I'll ask you what their question is, but this comes from uh, Greg and Ryan Barnes in Sydney, Australia. They told me to make oh, sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. so yeah. This- yeah. I, I was in uh, – I did a clinic in Australia in uh, – 2019, uh, with uh, with uh, the uh, Australian Mark Marino and and uh, and uh, Pop, and uh, and they came and and what I did is like they would they they had three or four catchers every day that would come in and we do a one on one and they were that they're great those two guys are outstanding. Awesome. Well, they they wanted to say hi and then their question was. Uh, your favorite piece of technology that's out nowadays. And I, I think uh, this actually, I've heard this question asked at a convention. I can't remember if it was ABCA or, or uh, just one of the smaller ones I spoke at, but um, obviously at the professional level, you guys are going to have access to some pretty high tech, cool stuff. Um, some high school programs are obviously not going to be able to afford the high tech fancy stuff. So, um, you know, obviously you're going to have your favorite, and you've already mentioned some of them, rap soda and that kind of stuff. And then you're going to have some, or do you have any recommendations or what are your thoughts on well, something the high school uh, program could use? I like, well, of course the, the, uh, uh, I, I like that uh, data, data kinetic uh, ball tracker where it tells you spin rate and spin axis and, and stuff like that. Cause I, you know, working with catchers throwing and then uh, the edgertronic, but you know your your iPhone video is good too. But I really I really like using the, the Edgertronic. Uh, but those those two and and I have a friend who's coming out with a, a new uh, timing uh, device that's going to really be revolutionary in terms of real accurate catch release and ball flight data uh, with uh, where the the catchers and infielders wear a device so that they can exactly time those two elements and that's going to be really good when it comes out those are specific to to catchers uh and then hit tracks has got a got a little uh catcher release thing and uh, it's not as accurate as i I, as i would like it to be i don't think i have not found it to be uh, but hit tracks is a great tool but uh to me that that ball tracker that concept of uh 
because to me, uh, we don't spend enough time with our catchers on uh, evaluating rotation and uh, and spin rate and, and spin X's and stuff like that. I love it. And one of the things you brought up, uh, Jadev, was the the um, the more accurate pop times. One of the things that's, again, another often debated topic on social media is showcase pop times versus in-game pop times. And people lose their minds when they see these uh, showcase pop times. But what I try and explain to them is um, obviously the coaches that are going to be recruiting these players and watching these players, they understand the difference between a showcase pop time and a in-game pop time. So the fact that Perfect Games posts in their top pop times from their last showcase, 177, 178, 181 kind of thing, the coaches aren't being fooled. We understand that. And I think, in my opinion, if you're getting a 1-7 by cheating the showcase way, then that translates pretty darn well into a, a good throwing catcher in game. That's going to probably say you're somewhere around two flat. I mean, it, if you're throwing one sevens in showcase, that doesn't mean you're going to be a two, two in a game that actually shows you've got a pretty good throw tool, right? I guess I, I think what I look for is, you know, the, the one absolute that's verifiable is velocity. So what that guy's velocity is. And then, uh, if, if I know he's got arm strength, then I can coach rotation and, and uh, transfer and accuracy and stuff like that. And so, you know, really, I'm not concerned with the 177 or whatever it happens to be. You know, I like to look for, you know, what, what his, arm, his raw arm strength looks like. And, I mean, the reality is that the average big league glove-to-glove -glove time is 2.01. And uh, so we we understand that, and, and, and you know it's a whole different ball game when when there's a pitcher out there you don't know where the ball's going and, and it's and uh, things are happening a lot faster and you don't know if the guy's running. It's not like he's definitely running on this pitch, and you have to react to the situation. So that's where the the disconnect is in in some of that showcase stuff. Sure. No. And again, that was that was kind of my point too. Like you said, it's uh, the coaches that know know. You know they. The argument is to stop posting it. It's crap. It's not realistic, but at the same time, it is. Uh, well, it's it's a it's a metric. It's a starting yeah. point. It's a you know, and like you said, a guy that throws one seven seven probably probably is a decent thrower, and and maybe it's not going to be one seven seven in a game when you don't know where the pitch is, and there's a hitter in your throwing lane, and and the umpire's leaning over you and and bearing down on you, and and the guy is, has fake break three or four times, and now he's running it, you know. Yeah. I mean, there's so many, so many factors in there. Yeah. Um, another couple, couple more, and we'll, we'll, uh, I don't want to take up any more of your time. Um, left-handed catchers, what are your thoughts on left-handed catchers? Will there ever be one at the higher levels? I don't – there's no real good reason why not. Other than, <laughs> other than when the pitcher looks in there, he, he might say, no, nah, I'm mean, throwing to that guy. <laughs> or girl, for that matter, <laughs> right. but, uh, there's there's not I don't there's not a good reason there's not a good reason uh, certainly on bunt plays you're in a and picks at first base throws to second base uh, especially with as many left hand hitters as there are in in today's game uh, I don't think there's any advantage and it's a you know it's challenging to throw to third base but there's a workaround uh, and I, there's no there's no really good reason now. We've seen the outlier, the Dale Long and uh, and Mike Squires get back there in an emergency, but uh, uh, really, there to me, I, I I don't see why not. And we get them. I get them at my camps here and there. Every once in a while, we'll have a lefty. Uh, I think one camp in particular I had three lefties, which was pretty crazy. But then I always get that question. You know, am, am I? Uh, Am I, do I need to change positions? And I was like, look, if you want to be a catcher, you go as long as you possibly can. And if you can catch, you can catch. I don't think the coach, if you, you know, if you're, if you're taking care of your responsibilities and your team's winning ball games and your pitchers like throwing to, uh, just keep doing your thing. But it seems like they get to, it's almost always high school. The, the coach ends up saying, no, you're going to be a first baseman. We've got a catcher. He's right-handed and, and, you know, he handles this better, whatever it is, but it's just, just curious if you thought that there would ever be one at the higher well, level. Especially a young, a young uh, player, whether a girl or a guy, you see it a lot. It's, I think he, it, correct me if I'm wrong, I think you see it more in softball than you do in, in baseball. But the reality is you put a young player back there and, 
and you get to be an athlete 100 pitches a game and you're in right in the middle of the mix so your your how to win awareness is elevated uh uh how can that not help you be a good player at another position right no absolutely um and again i i hate i i would never uh squash anyone's dream if you're left-handed and your goal is to be the next big league you know catcher I'm, I'm, I'm for that go for it because you know if you can hit and they're adverse to having a left-hander back there they'll find a place for you but you probably end up being a better hitter after having caught and seen all those pitches and and figured out how to get people out absolutely 100 percent um you know what i just realized is we talked about receiving and your your uh your you know keys to being a successful receiving catcher, but I never got to the blocking and throwing side of things. Do you still have a little time or is it dinner time? You bet. You bet. Okay. Go. Um, yeah, so just backtracking a little bit then to one of the tops because I think it's important, and, and this is more for my, uh, you know, my followers than anything. Um, and again, I like to actually see how we align and, and where we might be different, but what would you say is your um, three or four most important components to being a good blocking catcher? Well, uh, Number one is is creating the the right right types of angles and creating the right type of uh, of tension uh, that there there has to be it's it's more you're absorbing the ball for me and creating the right type of angle uh, side to side and over the top as well depending upon where the pitch is and what type of pitch it is uh, and uh, trying to cut the ball off as close to the point of contact as, as possible and you know. Uh, and, and and again, in, in a from a training perspective, I think that where we get in trouble with blocking is, you know, we'll do block we do block training of blocking. So where every you know every pitch is going to be in the dirt. Now certainly early on when we're tra when you're trying to build a foundation and trying to learn how to absorb the ball and you know round your shoulders and cover up the five hole and create enough of an angle for particular pitches to keep them close to you, that's great. But at a certain point. Uh, all the blocking and throwing and uh, receiving piece has to come together. So uh, you don't know if you're going to have to block or throw or receive on a particular pitch. So it becomes, there's a, you know, it becomes somewhat chaotic in, in nature and that every pitch is in a different spot. And I used to have this thing I called the gauntlet and it was eight pitches. Uh, actually, they were all fastballs because I like to practice blocking fastballs because guys are adverse to blocking fastballs. Sure. And, uh, and, and so that where you, it, you don't know where the pitch is going to be and you don't know what's going to happen. And then, you know, the ultimate is uh, catch uh, or receive and, or block. And then when you block, it's block, retrieve, and throw. So the throwing component comes in there because I want – it's a three-piece thing because you're blocking to keep the runner from moving up. And oftentimes the runner is reading balls in the dirt and moving up so now you got to pull off a, a, an accurate throw and get alignment get your body in a, the right position to throw and sometimes throw when it's out of alignment from different arm slots and different positions on the field so uh again you know building a foundation with block blocking practice and then building a better foundation building on that foundation with a random block retrieve and throw foundation uh that's random where you some are in the strike zone because a lot of times you know when you start blocking and all of a sudden you throw a ball in the strike zone they fall all over themselves sure you know, i want them in a receiving mode but have enough heightened awareness to be anticipatory relative to a ball in the dirt and reacting to ball in the dirt and then also where i'm really not anticipating ball in the dirt uh, that's what that's one of the things i like about the the one knee because you're never late you're always down. Yeah. You're always down. Uh, and where guys get in trouble blocking is they get late. When they get late, they get bad angles. When they get uh, late, they get hard in the ball. They'll be in a decent position, but they'll be so hard and stiff that the ball kicks away from them and the guy's going to advance. So, again, I think there are certain advantages. And, and again, some people are hearing this and, you know, they're writing me off right now. They're taking me. I'm off their Christmas card list. Oh, no, not at all. <laughs> no, I love everything. So I, what I heard was body position and posture, being able to control the ball, and then the whole mental component is so important that this decision-making process and reacting to what's given to you, right? Well, I think uh, 
getting down early enough that you can get to position, but not getting down so early that you miss, that you don't get to read the ball flight long enough where you can get in the right position. So it's a fine line. Sure. No, I, and I love, we actually incorporate the, uh, the decision-making process thing in, in all of our camps too. We'll break down, you know, blocking into um, sit and get hit series and, and, you know, practicing timing and all that. But then we always finish with uh, the block or receive um, component because again, the decision-making right. and reaction time and all that is so, so important. Yeah. I've seen a lot of guys that really move good when they know every pitch is going to be in the dirt in the same spot. And then, all of a sudden in the game when it becomes more random, they're, they're trying to pick balls because they, they get surprised. Yeah, no, for sure. And I actually, ha I have the same thoughts and philosophies on, on even receiving. So we see all the time on social media, someone will post, uh, look at how good Bobby is at, at pocketing the ball and he's on one knee and it's out of a machine and the pitch is going to the same, same, pretty, same every, over and over and same, over again. Same thing, same thing. And, and when I, when people, you know, post that I just want to say hey and I, but I don't but what you said is really and if people hear one thing in this little podcast it's mix it up vary it variable chaotic type because the game is very chaotic even the big leagues uh, big league pitchers miss their target 76 percent of the time with fastballs and they're the best target hitters in the world so uh, and a, for me a target miss is four inches or more Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, it's easy to receive when the pitcher hits their spot. It's the pitches that are away from where you're expecting it. That's when you start to get into real receiving and, and uh, the good receivers can make that quick adjustment to a pitch away from where they're expecting it, still pocket it and do their thing. Sure. So good yeah. stuff. Um, and then obviously the final component would be our final uh, category, I guess we could say would be on the throwing side of things when you, uh, when it's throwing day at spring training and you have your catchers or, or practice, whatever it is, um, you know, what do you tell them? Here's what I want you to do this, this, and this, like what would be three main components or well, most important for throwing for you? You know, I think this is where we're, we're lacking in, in all of baseball, how we monitor throwing programs and in outfielders and infielders. It's pretty random and social catch. And sometimes it could be that way with, with catchers as well. But I think having a well-designed throwing program, because as catchers, we throw more than anybody in the game, whether it's in a bullpen in the game, throwing in between innings, throwing people out. So we need to have a solid foundation. And one thing, I'm a real big believer in volume throwing. And uh, uh, if you talk to guys who have caught uh, for, for um, uh, teams that I've managed in the minor leagues, we pretty much throw every day. Well, and we would throw, always try to throw on the field from mm -hmm. home to second base. And we would start off with a, a lead up throwing drill, you know, we had like six or seven things, our basics, basic throwing, and we would use a, kind of a, a, a training ball. It was more like a hockey puck with a red stripe on it. And then we'd go to a stripe ball and then we'd have, anyway, we had a specific program that involved long toss and pull downs and then throwing to the bases. And the, the effort level would change depending upon how your arm felt on a particular day or if you were playing or not playing. And, and so I think a lot of throwing, especially to the bases, is good. It doesn't all have to be max effort. It can be effortless effort. Uh, but for me, the one thing that – the number one thing for me is getting alignment. And a lot of people feel like when you move your right foot, it's, it's to gain momentum and, and, and direction. But for me, I don't want to – I try not to gain direction – or a line, uh, direction uh, with my, my right foot. It's almost right, I just really simple, right behind left and left to your target, you know, and, uh, and you know, there's obviously a lot of components to doing that as well in terms of how you make your exchange, your transferring. For me, it's kind of at the sternum or even below the sternum because that helps with the sequencing of the uh, of rotation and, and and, and unwinding of the arm and then uh, and then you know from from there getting into a power position you know somewhere around 90 degrees or inside of 90 degrees anywhere between uh, 80 to maybe a, even 100 degrees and, and everybody's a little bit different and then uh, and then from there that that uh, 
uh, I get some type of, if possible, get some type of hip hinge where I talk about flexing at the waist slightly, which helps me get my butt behind, behind my heels and loads my glutes a little bit better, where I can work off my glutes and my, my whole foot and then striding toward my target, even though it can be a little bit closed, and then the arm unwinding in line with the rotation of the shoulders. And then with the hand, maybe slightly above, because uh, usually it's somewhere between 90 and 110 degrees, where my forearm is slightly up, and then, and then uh, you know, throwing the ball to the base with the ball above my hand. And again, we spend a lot like the, uh, the that uh, data kinetics ball tells you about your, your spin axis, but throwing with a stripe ball really gives you feedback and also throwing long distance and seeing how the ball tracks because distance magnifies bad rotation. If you have a good backspin, you're going to get more, you know, more carry and it's going to, you know, you don't want to be throwing sinkers if you can avoid and balls that are running way up the, the first baseline, even though if you're going to miss, that's where you want to miss. I mean, there's a, I mean, there's a lot to the throwing, thing, but I mean, the most simple thing is right behind left and left to the target and, uh, and, you know, that, you know, lead arm action is, is important too in terms of that it doesn't swing and, and that, that hip and shoulder open up at the same time where you can get a little separation in between hip and shoulder, even though not, maybe not as much as a, as a pitcher does, but where you can, can create some stretch and, you know, getting that elbow somewhere where there's some type of scap pinch so that there's, you can have that elastic component to your throwing. I mean, this is, this is a loaded question you asked me because <laughs> And we, we could go on a lot of different tangents, but, you know, that kind of gives you an idea that, you know, a lot of the things that come into the process. So, yeah, to me, it sounds like you prioritize uh, alignment to help with, uh, and, and I've actually, you're getting my brain going um, with as much as you talked about rotation on the ball and spin. That's Huge. something that I, I talk about, you know, 12 to 6, stay on top, create backspin, um, we get on the side of the ball, we're going to get sink, we're going to get tail, you get under it and get side spin, it's going to take off in the rest. So, so I talk about that stuff, but I don't do much drill wise during my events focusing on spin, but it actually, obviously the accuracy component is so important, the spin on that you're putting on the yeah, ball. I like, to get, I like to get guys throwing on the foul line. Some days if we can't get on the field, we throw on the foul line and we want, want that ball to stay on line with that foul line. Like I'll move just inside. So what? when my release, it's right on the foul line or if I'm in an indoor facility or a facility with, that has uh, turf with lines on it, you know, I try and use those lines. Yeah. And really, I really, I really try and, and get guys to spin the ball as much six to 12 as possible where it has true backspin. Now, even though uh, the guys with the better arm strength can carry a little bit of off rotation. So it's not gonna be at, right up at 12 o'clock where you're reaching behind your head and that elbow is kind of, you're almost like a waiter underneath the ball and you become more of a, uh, a, a pusher, yeah. high thrower. Uh, it's going to be somewhere out around one o'clock or one thirty. but as much as I can, I try and get that ball above my hand. The more it's out to the side of my hand, you know, and you'll see a lot of catchers that kind of will lean sometimes, which gets, you know, especially if you get a low outside pitch, and, and you have to throw, you got to get your head out of the way, which gets your arms up, arm up to a position where you can backspin the ball. But there are guys with really huge arm strength that throw in the, in the upper 80s and 90s that uh, they can carry bad rotation 126 feet easily. It's not an issue. That's like on, on the golf course, right? When you get a slice or a hook, you, you, you get, you know, it's going, 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 and then it takes off. And right. like you were right. just saying, you can That's, throw right through right. before it starts making the break. It's already at second. So, right. right. Yeah. Um, and then one other thing that you said that I want to talk about, and again, the footwork and alignment. So, you're uh, more of a replace, it sounds like, proponent. So, right to left, left to target. Uh, well, it's not right to left, it's right behind left. Okay. It's right behind left. I don't, and you know, uh, it's just to get a line. And you look at, if you look at all, a lot, and just the next time you look at guys throwing and watch where their feet go, and you'll see that it's pretty simple. It's, it's very simple. Now, some guys will 
people drop that knee in a little bit to help them get alignment, that's fine. I feel like when you drop that right foot, that gives you the alignment that you need. Most guys are very simple. They don't gain a lot of ground. When you start gaining ground, and the young guys tend to want to gain ground so that they can throw the ball harder. Mm-hmm. And the reality is they probably don't throw the ball harder. They would throw the ball harder uh, with that little little bit, almost a drop, a drop step. Sure. Um... You, I'm sure you've probably seen my post where I'll break down footwork and talk about the different techniques. I've actually done a couple of presentations, a couple of different coaches conventions where I spoke at. I've talked about this. Um, what, what do you tell them? To, I guess I'm going to kind of answer my, own, answer my own question, but I always use where's the batter. The batter's going to help be, you know, our, what footwork we use would be dependent on batter location, pitch location, and then where we're set up in relation to the batter. So if, if I have a right-handed batter up and I've called for a pitch on the outer half, so I'm set up kind of a way, I can do the right behind left, left the target, no problem, because I already have space away from the batter. But what if we've called an inside fastball? So now I'm right underneath that guy's hands. I really can't go right behind left, left the target because I'm risking hitting that batter, right? So what adjustments do you teach? Am I on the right track there as far yeah, as? I think, I think having a clean throwing lane is important. But uh, I, I want you to look at one thing, and just when guys accelerate the ball, whether you have a, 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 a you're timing it with a radar gun or not, you watch when guys move to their left. And this is just I don't, I don't have a scientific reason, but I think that they hinge better. I think that hinging piece is important, where they don't get into lumbar extension. Okay. Where they hinge, and when they move to their left, it's and, and I saw it. Geez, this guy throws a lot better with a left-hand hitter up there because what guys tend to do is what? When there's a left-hand hitter up there, they tend to swing out away. And when they swing out away, they end up hinging a little bit better. And that hinging action helps them to use their lower half and transfer energy from their glute up through the, you know, from, actually it goes from the middle of their, their, their pelvis down to the ground and back up through their body, in my opinion. So... I think that that little swing to the right is not a bad thing. Now, where it becomes a problem, if you're in on a on a on a uh, right-handed hitter and the ball's inside, it's almost like I've got to rake that ball a little bit more and not move in towards that hitter if you can, so that you can have a clean throwing lane. Okay, so you just maybe shorten that step a little bit. Wouldn't necessarily go right foot behind left foot. It'd be kind of right foot just slide maybe, over. Maybe, but I think if if as long as you don't move in. Unless you're really crowded in there behind uh, a right-hand hitter, that if you drop your right foot back, that you're basically throwing through that guy to second base. Now I can do that to third base, but yeah. to second base when you're trying to find a hole in the hitter and you have to throw through that guy, uh, that that's a problem. That's why with left-handers and let's say guys, uh, you got a right-hand pitcher and he's throwing a belt line cutter, and now I've got to kind of delay a little bit. I can't move early because if I do, the ball's liable to tip off the end of my glove. So my, my alignment, my movement's going to be a little bit later in that situation. Sure. Awesome. Good stuff. Good stuff. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll be in touch. Thanks. Enjoy it. Right. Have a good night. See ya. See ya.